application. The last part is deploying the app, and we'll show you exactly how that works in a little bit. So kind of touch on this a little bit. So the tooling that we're making available is a Flash Pro CS5. That'll really let you make your application. It shows in the publish panel, and we share a lot of the same settings as Air. And you can basically um, publish a thing, you know, your app in, is an Air file as well as into Flash Player 10, depending on what you're using. One of the really interesting things that we found when we're going and building this is that, you know, Apple, when they laid out how their uh, native applications work, you know, require a lot of metadata. What's the icon? What's the default launch screen? What's a text description? What's, you know, the, the first file to run? All this kind of metadata that's required to kind of bootstrap an app up. So what we did was we kind of said, okay, this kind of feels a little similar to, you know, some, so we'll use some, borrow some concepts from the Air environment so that for our developer community, it feels much like building a native, uh, building an application that would run inside of our own environment. So the phone itself is actually, you know, requires a lot of consideration. So one of the really interesting things that we found when we're porting some apps, and I'll give you a good example of um, this game called Red Hood that I mentioned earlier. It's available for download. It's a game where you actually had used a mouse in the, in the past on the web to go select something. So there's a, a woman who has a bandage on her arm. You click on the bandage, and then you know, if you click on the bandage and it doesn't show up in the different image, you get points. So that works great. You know, the mouse is a very precise input mechanism. Your finger, not so much. Roughly speaking, the finger is about seven, pixel, seven millimeters wide, which on an iPhone is about 44, 44 pixels wide. So we actually thought for a really long time when we were developing this uh, app, that we actually had bugs in the runtime and bugs in the infrastructure, that we were missing mouse events. It turns out when the hit targets are too small, your finger will just never hit them, no matter how hard you try. So remember, there's some good signs behind you know, making sure your hit targets are large enough and that your finger is not the same as a mouse. There's a lot of difference in how these things operate. You know, the screen is kind of this typical HVGA uh, 480 by 320. The status bar takes up 20 pixels. Of course, if you're building an app, you can go full screen and get those 20 pixels back. And then the fonts. So, you know, we're a creative community. We love our typography. We're using our new beautiful Adobe Clean font and all of our slideware and our presentation materials today. Um, but learn to love Helvetica. It's your friend. And so if you remember uh, from Flash, underscore sans basically maps on the iPhone to um, Helvetica. Helvetica is your friend. Love it. Don't love it, but use it. Either way. So these are some of the considerations to talk about, think about when you're using uh, the phone. Now, First question I think that a lot of people probably asked when we made this announcement is, well, you know, the iPhone has a rich set of APIs. Flash has a rich set of APIs as well. You know, and so what we actually have is kind of this nice little melange of both of these together. So basically, most of the Flash 10.1, so what Kevin Lynch showed today, and the Air 2.0 APIs are available on the iPhone. So this specifically means stuff like audio, you know, if you want to play back an MP3, uh, net connection and remote shared objects if you're working with an FMS server. Uh, the file system, so one of our games, uh, Trading Stuff in Outer Space, actually saves state using uh, the file system, APIs that are typically available in Air, but are also now available inside of this development environment. So, you know, other capabilities in the same model are, you know, local shared objects are also available for developers. So, however, you know, the iPhone, like I was mentioning, you know, we have a plethora of new kind of APIs that are available. So, Media Library is one that I mentioned earlier. This lets you write to the camera roll. We're, it's you know, not completely baked if we'll allow you to actually read out of the camera roll yet, but you know, at least let you put images into there and save you know, things that you're working on. Um, multi-touch, we kind of showed there's two ways that multi-touch can operate. Actually really interesting. So one is you can actually get the low level touch event data. So you can say, I see a finger come down here and a finger come down here and I'm tracking two points together and I get an ID to correlate them. The other way is you can actually use our gesture APIs so we actually composite from those low-level touch events a higher-level uh, bit of information. So for example, if I touch and swipe, you can actually subscribe to either the touch events, which will actually give you the raw data that you can decide what to do with, or you can uh, register for the gesture events, which will actually give you the entire gesture and say, you did a swiping gesture. And these are new APIs that are also available in Flash Player 10. And then as well, uh, some of the stuff that we talked about on, uh, with Air 2.0 earlier this morning is the Sockets APIs. You'll also have available access to these. So if you want to write into Socket um, or listen on Sockets, you'll also be able to uh, make you know, maybe a web server if you want to using this technology in AS3. It'd be a, it's totally up to you. So that's great. That's good. There's some stuff that we love that's going to be unusable. There's good reasons for this. I'll go over each one of them. First one is Pixel Bender. Unfortunately, Pixel Bender right now, in the context of 
the Flash platform is an interpreted piece of code. You write it in the constructs in the language of Pixelbender and actually gets interpreted at runtime. So because of the license restrictions in the iPhone SDK, we can't actually ship any interpreted code or an interpreter to code. And so unfortunately, we're unable to ship a, a, a Pixelbender kind of engine or execution environment. Secondly, you're actually unable to load remote Swifts that contain code. So remember, let's back up a second. I was talking about the ABCs, right, inside of a Swift file. So when you load a Swift, you say, like in the ActionScript 2 world, if you load movie off the network and you, you pull down a Swift and you want to throw it inside of another uh, Swift, this actually, what ends up happening under the hood is we go grab this Swift, we actually read through it, and then actually go and execute the instructions that were inside of that. Again, as I mentioned with Pixelbender, we don't actually have the runtime in this application. You are a runtime-free native application. So we're actually unable to actually load a Swift that contains ActionScript. But however, if you did have a Swift that contained vector art, animations, those sorts of things, maybe some MP3s, maybe some audio, feel free to load those. But you can't load a Swift that actually has ActionScript inside of it. It just won't work. Uh, third is, you know, we're talking about Air APIs too. HTML loader, if you're familiar with the Air API surface, no access to that either because that requires shipping a JavaScript interpreter as well. So you're kind of seeing a kind of theme around these ones, why these were pulled out. A lot of this is just the license restrictions that exist today. And those are the things that were playing nice inside that box. And then the last one is kind of going to be obvious after um, talked about the first three is AS1 and AS2. We love them. We love them. But we're in the world of AS3 now. Um, AS3 is a much better uh, environment and language for us to be able to ahead of time compile and basically make ARM code out of it. So we don't support any code that was written in AS2 and AS3. Interestingly enough, some of the apps that we made earlier that were using Flashlight were actually built with AS2 first. Smaller screens, we, so we uh, sized them up, converted from AS2 to AS3. How long did it take? Eh, maybe about a week. So you can kind of see the value in the uh, system that we're bringing towards de to developers. And I'm sure you guys are going to have questions, and I'm trying to make sure we book time at the end for questions too. Don't worry. So the other thing is, I was mentioning and alluding to this earlier, the iPhone is no desktop computer. It's got great hardware, great memory. It's got a nice GPU on it. But it's still not a desktop computer. So you've got to think when you're developing your app to build for a mobile device. So there's a couple things that actually are really interesting that we found, and we'll share some of these with you. Other sessions go into the much deeper technical details. When you build your display list in ActionScript 3, you know, it's really easy to just add child, add child, add child, make these really deep, complex display lists. One of the problems that we find is you know, really deep display lists require really long display list traversal when you're moving your finger around. And if you think about it, when I've got my iPhone in my hand, this is not my iPhone. <laughs> when you've got my iPhone in my hand, the first thing you want to do is start tapping around and seeing what's going on. Every one of those taps requires you know, um, a display list traversal to find where you were tapping. So that's, you know, that's totally OK, as long as your display lists are shallow and they and they're only represent basically what's on the screen. So there's actually a lot of work that we have done to kind of help um, you know, in our developer guides that are going to be available um, on when we make the product available later this year that will help you kind of understand you know, when to think about your display list, when you're looking at it, if it's too deep, too narrow, too shallow. And so making sure that's OK. The um, other one in that same bucket is the display uh, managing your mouse events. Excuse me. So what we also found is you know, if I'm clicking on you know, a game here and I click an item, and there's something way down deep in the display list, and it's going to be there, and I want to capture the event. The problem with the way that ActionScript works is the way that events are fired in is this capture bubble model. It's kind of familiar if you're a JavaScript developer. So we send the event down to whoever it's going to get it, and then we send it back up to anyone else who's listening for it. So what you really want to do is when you're thinking about these is as soon as you've found the event that you want, just stop it from going anywhere else and kill the event propagation. That means that other, ob um, other display objects that were listening to the event don't need to listen to them. And then the last two are really around kind of using the hardware. So you know, if you're familiar with building Flash content that's really super optimized, you're really familiar with Cache's bitmap. Cache's bitmap's your friend. You know, actually, one of the really interesting things, and I implore you to try this on your own iPhones, fire up uh, Safari. Click on Safari and go to a web page and actually load up New York Times. It's a great example of this. What actually ends up happening is the whole page is rendered and a bitmap is snapped of the image. And then that's actually what you're panning around on. It's actually a really great uh, technique for getting really high performance. And what you can actually see and how you can see this, as soon as you pinch it, you can actually see a um, zoomed in image that's zoomed in hardware. And then as soon as you let go, the renderer redraws it and recaptures that bitmap image. 